Hello, my name is Professor Matthew Schmidt, and this is Genetics. And in today's session, we're going to start a series of a few sessions that have to do with large-scale chromosome aberrations. Basically, that means, well, it means just what it says. Large-scale meaning. We've talked about mutations before. We've even talked about things like deletions. But now we're talking about sort of very large pieces of entire chromosomes that are either lost or rearranged, et cetera. And in particular, in this, uh, in this session, we are going to talk about the chromosomal rearrangements. So let's set the stage for this because there are a couple of different types of changes that fall into this category. So as I just said, we have discussed gene mutations in the past in a couple of contexts. Often these are, you know, could be one single base pair change, which is a point mutation. Um, so they're, they're limited to a very specific part of the genome. Now, in a chromosomal mutation, the large-scale structure of the chromosome or the overall number of chromosomes, one or the other, can be, is affected. So we're going to break this up into a couple of different um, sessions. Today, in this session, we're going to talk about the four major types of chromosomal rearrangements, which are deletions, duplications, inversions, and translocations. Then we're going to have a session on aneuploidy, which refers to a change in the overall chromosome number, and polyploidy, which refers to a different type of change in the overall chromosome number. So all of these affect the genome in a rather macroscopic way. But one thing that's interesting to keep in mind, you might be tempted to think, wow, these are big changes, they're big physically, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be quote, better or worse in terms of the, t the phenotype for an organism. You can't really say, I mean, sickle cell anemia is one base pair mutation, right? And that causes some pretty severe phenotypic effects. We're going to see situations where some of the, these large scale changes really don't have such bad phenotypic effects. But as we go through all of them, I think it'll make sense. So we'll start with deletions. Now, the concept of a deletion is pretty straightforward. It refers to a missing chromosome segment. We even discussed deletions before when we were talking about fine structure mapping with Benzer. Now we're talking, though, about potentially a much, much larger deletion. I mean, if you deleted one-third of chromosome one, you might be talking about 600 genes that are now gone away. That's an extreme example, but it could be giant like that. Now, how could this happen in the first place? Well, it turns out that chromosomes do break. It, it's sort of a natural phenomenon. It's certainly accelerated by things like radiation damage, et cetera. And there are repair mechanisms that try and sort of glue them back together. So if there's a break and subsequently a lack of proper repair, um, a segment that broke off and is supposed to be glued back on may end up not doing so. So what's left in that chromosome will be missing whatever part. I mean, this is one of the problems with this, this lecture. It's not really a problem, but it's just that um, the general concept of the deletion is straightforward. But whether it's big or small, what exact specific genes that it encompasses, et cetera, will have a really important um, effect on how this actually affects an individual phenotypically. But we can make some generalized statements. So in a heterozygous form, and be clear you understand what I mean by that. So most people, if there was a stable deletion, they would inherit that from one of their parents if they had it, and they would get a, quote, normal chromosome from the other parent. So you'd have one normal and one deleted, so you'd be a deletion heterozygote. Now, this type of mutation may be deleterious or bad due to dosage problems. We're going to talk more about this in the next lecture, but suffice it to say that eukaryotes are supposed to have two copies of every gene, right? Two copies of every chromosome, et cetera. So if you have, that, have a deletion and you're missing one copy of a gene, say, well, there's a dosage effect. Instead of two, you only have one now. There's no global way of saying how exactly that's going to affect things because it depends on the gene and a lot of other factors. But just be aware that 
dosage problems do exist, and again, we'll come back to this later. Perhaps more interesting is the unmasking of a recessive allele, and I'll show you a, a picture of this in a minute. This is also termed pseudodominance, but the idea is um, it's almost like if you remember the term hemizygous, um, in males, since we only have one X chromosome, there's only one copy of any allele, so it's going to get expressed whether it's technically a recessive allele or a dominant allele. In this same sort of idea, um, if all of a sudden you only have one copy of an allele, even though it may be a mistake, that allele is going to be expressed whether it's technically recessive or dominant. So that's why we call it pseudo-dominant, sort of a fake dominant, meaning though it will be expressed. Now, it would be very unlikely for this to happen, but sometimes they ask questions about unlikely events. If you had a homozygous deletion of the same chromosome, the same deletion type, I should say, likely it would be lethal. But this is, again, making the assumption that the deleted region is important, that is, it contains genes necessary for life. Often you can exist with only one copy, but if you have no copies, that's usually a pretty big problem. All right, so here's a pretty, I hope, but not really revolutionary picture. In this case, a normal chromosome, and we're going to use this chromosome as a reference as we go throughout this, it has the genes A, B, C, D, E, F, G on it. And after the deletion occurred, in this case, the tip, the region that contained gene A, is now missing. Now, it doesn't have to be at the end. It could just as well have been in the middle, but this is just the way we made the picture, okay? So this is showing you that it's a large scale. Now, in terms of our genes and our markers, it's like we're only missing gene A. But in fact, you know, if this was a large chromosome, this region, it could be gigantic. It could be a small deletion. There's really no way to make a generalization. All right, so let's take a look at some of the consequences of this. Cytologically, now cytology, it's a little bit of an oversimplification, but it basically means looking at, the, at chromosomes under the microscope. So this is very significant, and during meiosis, so in other words, if you're going to be making gametes, this is where we see a lot of interesting things going on with these chromosomal rearrangements. You're going to observe a deletion loop and the reason is because there's no homologous region for the normal chromosome to pair up with where the deletion is. So here's one of my rather poor drawings probably. Here's a normal chromosome, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, in a different color. Let's say, I'm going to draw it differently than the chromosome we just saw. This one has A, B, and C, but let's say um, what's deleted here is D, E, and F, right? Or just D and E, let's say. So we have F and G. That's how these things are going to pair up. But look what's going to happen. So I'll draw it again. We're going to see this part loop out because A, B, C, F, G, the homologous regions still want to line up with themselves. So D, E, in this case, ends up being sort of shoved out because there's nothing, there's nothing on the other chromosome for it to pair up with. So that is the deletion loop right there. Um, D and E are like, I can't find my partners. And there's a good reason for that. It's because they're not there. All right? So that is a deletion loop. In theory, you would always see it, but the larger the deleted area, the physically larger the loop is going to be. From a genetic point of view, and this is, we already mentioned this, but number one, a deletion mutation, and this is true whether it's a little one or a big one, so we did talk about this in the Benzer section as well, but there's never any reversion. In other words, certain mutations, you leave them alone long enough, you'll see reversion mutants that go back to the normal phenotype. But when something's deleted, there's nothing there. It can't revert, right? And you can't have any crossing over in the deleted region. You can see that over here. I mean, D and E, they have nothing to cross over with because it's gone. 